Okay. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to this class. Part of it's going to be um, basically a discussion, a presentation about medieval jewelry, and then we will go into the hands-on if you want to do hands-on if you got your stuff together it's not required um i will demonstrate whatever you need to, to start a necklace um but it's tough it's here you're here to learn something and to enjoy um a part of history that well seen in the SCA. So to get started, I gotta change to my thing. Okay, how much slide show? Come on. From the beginning. Okay. Okay, that didn't do. Okay, hang on. Okay. Just green. Where are you? Ah, just a moment. Technical difficulties. Okay. 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 Are you showing up? I saw it. Come on. Dang it. I'm sorry, everybody, it's being a pain. Let's see if I can. That's not. Why won't you do? Okay. 
why aren't you coming up? We're perfect a year later. I'm sorry, buddy, that it was working perfectly earlier, and now it doesn't want to play with me. I am trying to see. Okay. All right. Any computer whizzes? No, I was shared earlier, and it worked fine, and now it doesn't want to play with me. Uh, Shame on it. And it should. Okay. How long ago did the class start, or did it, uh, I'm not sure the time. I've got the, the presentation ready to roll, but it's not pulling up in the whiteboard. Oh, so it hasn't started yet? Um, and I had it up earlier. Okay, hang on. That makes me mad. Well, Tuckies. I've got it on. Can anyone see the PowerPoint? No. No. I had a good PowerPoint too. Uh, if you go into the Zoom and look at the bottom section, you should see a button that says share screen. Believe, are you the only host? Okay, thank uh, you. I think I fixed the issue. Okay, hang on. That's not it. Come on. Come on. Quit. If I 
Can I ask a question? What times on the spreadsheet? What time zone is that in? This is six, it's a central daylight time. Okay, so that's one that that's one hour ahead of Pacific, right? Two hours. Two hours? Okay, thank you. Because uh, Pacific is two hours earlier than us, than Central Time. Picking up the handout. Okay. Is there any way to um, maybe um, email it to somebody quickly and they could load it up on their computer? I out, I, it's the handout I put out on Facebook. Yeah, you can find it on the on Steora website. Okay. Yeah, if the class handout is in the repository, the MCR repository of the class handout. Uh, okay, thank you. That or perhaps Philip could um, could show it. It's later on his screen, and then we could just. You could have do the voice. Makes you mad. I had it already. It won't. I actually do not know where the uh, presentation is supposed to be. So. All right. Problem is, I don't have it in my Google Drive. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. totally sorry that this is still new to me and wasn't behaving. Okay. Now can everybody here see it? Yes. Yay! Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, this is Miss Medieval Style Jewelry 101, how to bring a guard medievally without breaking your wallet. Presented by me at King's College. This class is about the process of making medieval style jewelry. What the, what they have done during the Middle Ages and what we can do now. Uh, a lot of the materials that we have in this present day were used in the medieval and Renaissance periods. What I show here is how to, to make the jewelry without a huge cost to you today. Uh, medieval artisans of Europe used many materials that they either made or traded for from other lands. Uh, they did a wide variety of materials. 
linen thread, metal wire, uh, leather cord. They also had beads from all over the world. And they were also made in England, Ireland, Scotland, and the Western Europe. They were usually from a semi-precious stone like Carnelian, Amazonite, um, lapis, other things like that, stone, uh, like granite, and feldspar, and um, jasper, wood of all different varieties because it was easily turned into beads, clay, bone, metal and glass. You can find many of these examples of the these, of necklaces shown in paintings that were done during the Middle Ages and Renaissance periods. In this handout, you'll see some of the, those paintings and representations. Here's one of the most recognized styles of medieval necklaces is the Viking style. This style is started in the Scandinavian and Iron Age and went up all the way to the 1400s in Northern Europe and in parts of other parts of Western Europe. Uh, what we know as Viking treasure necklaces are a type of necklace called a cascade necklaces. The cascade necklaces usually have multiple strands and they're not there, they hang naturally into uh, its own loop, like it cascades down the front of your, your uh, tunic dress or your tunic shirt. Uh, many of these necklaces will feature different kinds of metals um, and ceramics and clay and glass stone as you can see in this see in this uh, photo not all these necklaces were hung on the on the brooches some were hung by hangers that would hook into the 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 tunic dress or the the tunic shirt here's some examples this is a modern example but if this is actually a um, fifth century set of necklaces. This, the picture on the, the right closer to the view window is from a painting called the Red um, Jewels. That is carnelian that was milled and rounded to look like balls in a necklace. Many of the necklaces that were done between 250 AD and to 800 AD had different forms. According to the culture that was wearing the necklaces, and you start out with the ornate of, of the figure E all the way to the 775 to 800 uh, common brooches that we see on a lot of Scandinavian, I mean, a lot of Scandinavian uh, Viking dresses as well as what you see in the SCA at events. And then it shows just the progression of how ornamentation was worn and just a simple style to the ornate. And then the ornamentation, ornamentation too, you see really, where it really gets um, more ornate and complex. And you will see a lot of that at SCA events if they are um, wearing it in period. If you see in the 600, whoops, 600, you'll see just the plain cascade necklace. And the other two had spacers. 
and here we go, come to making a medieval style necklace. What is involved? First, that you ha have parts of the necklace that make up the whole. The foundation is all the um, metal chain and leather and fabric cords that hold all of the beads or metal uh, bindings. That's the foundation, the chain or the wire or the leather rope or fabric cord. The decorations are the beads that you see, the pendants and the trinkets and the fest, what they also call as festoons. And the clasp, the last part of the necklace, because that holds all of it together onto your dress or your tunic. And this is a diagram of just what I was, what I was talking about from the terms. You have the, the three stand stranded cascade necklace with the graduated, whoops, graduated size. And then you have the connect, it's called an in bar that holds each loop separately. And from there you can hook it to a chain that'll go around your neck and then the toggle class holds it together. And here's some of the types of beads that you will see in uh, a Viking treasure necklace or cascade necklace. Majority of those are clay beads. Some are um, semi-precious stone. The orange ones are semi-precious stone. It just depends on what they were working with and how they were working. This is a, these pictures, artwork, are from archaeological finds of in Burka and some of the other uh, Scandinavian sites where they found these beads in, in the burial sites. There's some of the you normally would use. Uh, cutters to cut the wire, to round wire, um, and so forth. And then hold the crimper beads so that everything won't fall off. There's some of the wire that normally used. Uh, I would suggest if you do a necklace, do it in wire. It'll it has a better strength pull. If you get wire, you will. How much is usually on a spool? What in meters in it? What the tube strength troop size is? To, to run the wire through. And then right next to it is the crimps. This, the other photo is cord, but yes, cord's good. It's also a little more uh, durable because if you do too many crimps in metal, it will break. The cord's good, but tying off the cord is a lot more complex and a pain in the back. So I would advise doing the wire, not, but not doing a necklace for a child with wire, because at least with the cord, it'll break easier. The wire tends to be stronger and it might choke the child. That's just a warning. And this is types of class that when you would work with for your, your necklace. Uh, most common, ones of the lobster, the ring, and the uh, toggle class. There's a hook and eye right here, right there, next to the bronze screw type. And in the cylinder, multiple multi-loop uh, bar connector. This is some of the well directions for crimping the wire at the end of your necklace onto the toggle. Now go to in depth. And I have put further uh, demonstrations of how to connect your class to the wire.
to make it sure it holds. And then this will show this photo, these photos show two other ways to connect your necklace strands. One of them is an end bar with multi loops. And these end bars can go as long as 10 loop bars, which is about three inches long. That's a little complex, but it'll get the job done. And then you can connect it to the other part of the chain. The other way is connect all the loops of the, the different strands onto a, a ring and then connect it to a chain. And this is for reference, just how much wire you would need to make a necklace for a woman, a man, a larger neck person, a child and a, and a baby. And the next reference that's on your hand, that's part of your handout, is showing just what the beading wire spool has on uh, the information on it. It's really good to know because it'll give you an idea of what you need for the project. The color of wire, the, the strength of the wire, uh, it shows two different bead opening sizes, wire di diameter, how much is on the, the wire, and some of the spools will have a pull, a strength uh, indication. That indication, which is over on the soft flex, says test strength 26 pounds. That 26 pounds is how much pull would, to, would it take to break that wire? The better the strength is, the more permanent your necklace will, will remain. Like, unlike the thread, the thread will break far more easily with the wire, it takes longer and you will less have trouble with all of it coming on the floor. Uh, I put in a bibliography. It's a couple pages long. It's a lot of uh, sources from uh, the Viking Age. It's quite a bit there if you want more than information. And it was actually less pages when I had it before. Some of the internet sources actually show you what the necklaces look like uh, in photos, early period of necklace, how to make a Viking necklace, um, and even a Wikipedia uh, information page. More into the Pagan Ladies necklace. Um, a couple of SCA um, members, what they did with their necklaces. Viking treasure. There's even a Viking answer lady also has a piece on how to make a Viking necklace. And some of the credits for some of the uh, photos. And that's my um, Contact information on Facebook. I'm a Cat Watson. On email is uh, my email address. It should be done. Stop sharing. Okay. Y'all can see me now. I can see you. Cool. Okay. Let me see if I can sh share my board. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, ah, here we go. Okay. 
Can you see the board? Yes. Cool. Okay. This is some of the materials, part of the materials that would be in a necklace or a necklace you would like to make. Uh, many of the necklaces, I'm wearing some of them. Let's see that. Okay. This is carnelian. This is a semi precious uh, chips and glass chips and amber. This is a metal one that I made that has a permanent beads on it, but the pendant will slide. And those are, are similar to the medieval style jewelry that you will see in many of the pictures. On the stand, the other kinds of necklace that you can make that will be period is these two are wooden and this is a uh, metal and glass on wire. The other two, the wooden ones are on uh, cord. There we go. And there, these are some of the materials you, what I told you earlier, uh, this is an in bar. It has three loops so you can make a multi um, strand necklace. Easiest necklace though is just doing one strand because it's less complicated because when you have to crimp the wires to put the to connect to the toggle class is easier to do one just the two the, on each end of the necklace than multi ones. Um, and then you have different kinds of pendants you can use if you want to do pendants. This one you, you can use for pendants uh, or bracelets. And you can even do um, what you would normally call day and danglies. That's what that. Those can be put in between the beads. Um, there we go. And then you can get semi-precious stones in different uh, formations. You can get them in the bezel. Sorry, uh, chips, uh, the rounded ball beads, and then the, the other beveled faceted stone. And you can find all of this in Hobby Lobby, Michael's and Joanne's. Uh, all the materials I have on here are from those three, uh, craft stores. You can get faceted beads and you can get beveled beads depending on what you want to play with. Um, real good thing for economy's sake, a good way to get the most beads without the heavy price, get them in multi-strand clumps like this, you, you have bone and you have glass. So you have about, oh, about 10 necklaces right there. Just for using the ready-made clump that you can buy at uh, Joann's and Michael's and Hobby Lobby. This is very economical because then you don't have to go back over and over again to the store. Um, and then you have the variations of two or more strands. When you get some of them, they'll give you more than one strand. That'll give make you a necklace 
pretty easily and, and effectively. Some of this, this is bone right here. This is a one strand. It just depends on what you're looking for. These right here are clay, but they look a lot like the beads as you see in the Viking necklaces. So this would be a ready-made um, components to your necklace. Uh, other forms. This is shell right here, which is this one right here is shell. The other one is lava, lava stone. So there is a wide variety, and you can get, even get real beautiful agate. This is green crackle agate, which is a semi precious stone. Um, and a tremendous amount of things. And some of the strands, like I said, if you can, get them in multi size. This was at Michael's, and it's four different strands from the uh, four millimeter to the 10 millimeter. That gives you a variety when you're making your necklaces, you can have more than one size. Um, and then you can also get not only semi-precious uh, chips like this, you can get chips in the glass too. So there's a wide variety of pieces that you can get to start your necklace. Um, and the snakes, the pendants right here, both are glass. Those are snake pendants. This one's not showing up, there it is. Uh, this is Jasper. That's a donut, and it's that can easily just put a cord through it, and you've got an inch and necklace. This one you would connect by the the upper loop, and it looks more in the in the range of the the Renaissance, but that's metal and glass. So. All of these, you can make a necklace with no problem all without paying a huge amount of money. The nice thing about the, the present time, you can get quite a bit of semi-precious stone for a small price. And it's in all three, Michael's, Joanne's, and Hobby Lobby. This is right here is Aventurin. I've gotten tons, of, all the Carnelian I have on this board is semi-precious Carnelian. And I, I've been hoarding a lot of it because it's harder to find nowadays. Most of what you see now is fire agate or red agate. But I like the Carnelian. So there's quite a bit that you can Put together on the necklace. Any questions? And also faceted. That's check glass right there. Hello. Hi, y'all still here? <laughs> We're here. Okay. Um, that's the materials. Uh, normal necklace. I'm gonna show you. Uh, Michelle has a question. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, do, if you want to say it, go ahead. Oh, um, I was just curious about, um, what kind of bones they used and um did they carve them like i know lots of cultures they they carve bones to be um you know religious symbols or um um you know just or have special meanings i was just wondering if they did anything like that let me check 
I'm sure it's a probably a cowbone. Um, the label, the tab on the label, it says mixed bone. It does not say what the origin of the bone is. I'm assuming it's probably cow because it's the most prol prolific bone on the planet because we eat so much beef. Um, a lot of the bone during the, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, majority of it were from elk, moose, um, and cow, a deer, uh, whatever they had at hand. Uh, the Northern European had a great access to all that, those uh, mammals to get the bone from. Uh, they, the, more, the people in the lowlands or near the coast, they would have less access to it, though they would have if they have cow or pig or horse. Uh, in the fishing communities, they de dealt a lot with whalebone and fish bones, depending on the type of fish. Whale bones is a lot more uh, dense bone because uh, seamen have been using whale bone for centuries to, to etch um, pictures and writing on the bones. They've made pipes out of the bone, whale bone, whatever they had access to. So I think that I'm more guessing more that this is probably cow bone. Not without going to the source and finding out for sure. <laughs> but that I can believe that. And on this comp too, I believe that is all probably also these right here are probably cow bone, cattle bone. Any other questions? Uh, did anybody want to see a demonstration of just what it is to put in a necklace or whatever? I started one. I get out the thing. There we go. This is the start of a necklace. I put a, a stopper on the end, just so everything wouldn't slide. What you would do is clamp right there. You put a crimp on the, the wire so it won't come off. The nice thing about this, then when you're ready to change it to connector, all you have to do is open up the jump ring, take this off, and put a toggle clasp on it. And then the rest of the beads, so it will look nicer, is to run that edge, that extra uh, part of the strand. You can run through the bead and tighten up all the beads down the line, and then you won't find it again. It won't. If you cut it not too close to the end, it won't uh, irritate your neck if you do the beads tight enough. And then usually a composition of a necklace is with a starter bead, another bead, spacers in between, or graduate the the form of the necklace with two beads, one spacer, another bead, one spacer, and down the line. And the wire I'm using is a metal wire with a brass finish. But this one is strong. This is a 20, the 29 thing. Uh, and earlier when you were looking at 
the uh, stool and it said 49. That's 49 wires twisted together to make this one wire. It's a, it's the toughest wire of the, the beading wires. If you get seven, it will kink harder and break faster. The higher the, the strand uh, braid is, the better off you are. Because this is just like sewing thread. There we go. Hard to see them. Just like sewing thread. It's very flexible. The only problem with it, you can't bead with, weave with it. Because the more you weave with this, it'll put, um, it will start making the tensile strength brittle and it'll start breaking apart. That's when you would use the cord. When you have to do peyote, right angle weave, um, brick stitch and all that, you really would need to use a cord. But that's a different kind of jewelry that I, I know. This one is the simplest to do because necklaces are very easy because all you're doing is stringing. Stringing the amount of uh, beads that you want and until you have a finished necklace. This one right here. One of, one of the ones I did. It has spacers in between. It's all carnelian. On one end, I've, uh, I put the, uh, the loop with the crimp and then string it. Best idea, if you want, if you're just doing a necklace without a pendant, put the the crimped loop on there because that acts like a stopper. And, and then the other side, you start stringing all the beads onto the wire. And it's real easy, simple. If you're doing a pendant, I would say start from both sides, use a bead stopper where you can hook it on one end of the, the, the wire. It'll keep all the beads from falling off. And then start each side with, with the, the amount of beads you want, spacers and beads you want. Do one side, put the pendant, hook the pendant on it, and then do the other side and then finish it off with the crimp bead, holding the wire and looping it into a jump ring and then a toggle class. That's the easiest way. Uh, like I said, the cascade necklaces are a little bit more because you have to make three to five of these depending on how many loops you want on your cascade necklace. Uh, and you have to make them separate and then you hook them into the uh, strand rings to hook them into the brooches. But like I said, this is easy. This is the simplest way to do a necklace, whether it's a wood necklace right here, the glass necklace right there, or what I'm wearing right here. The chips, all it was is stringing the chips together. Hardest part was, other than getting the, the clasp done on the end of the necklace, is deciding how you want to make your necklace. Because you have to figure out a pattern you want. That's the hardest part because you have to decide the color, the shape, the different kinds of beads on it, the findings on it, um, what it makes, how you want your necklace to look like. 
and that's the hardest part is just being able to um, get it to look like you want. And it takes patience. But if you do knitting and crochet and weaving, you'll have the patience. <laughs> any more qu any questions? Uh, any ideas, any uh, thoughts? Um, did they do any kind of um, um, beating um, like we see now or that um, Native Americans do? Did they do anything like that in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance? Uh, yes, they did. Actual, in actuality, the Toltecs, Mestecs, Aztecs, Apache, Cherokee, and all that were doing necklaces in the BC time period. They, they, they just didn't know about it because they were an ocean away. And the conquistadors didn't come into um, Central America and South America until the 1300s and 1400s. <clears throat> so there was not a lot of inter uh, mixing of, of the Europeans and the, and the North American, South American Indians. But they have found many uh, necklaces that would look like this in grave sites. Uh, among the tribes and, and, and individual tribes. Um, the Apache would be uh, part of it, descended from the Aztec uh, and Toltecs. So they, they did a lot of the things. It's just most people don't know it unless you see the Native American people now have carried on the tradition of their uh, jewelry and their uh, loom weaving. And, uh, and also the fact that the uh, Western Europeans, Eastern Europeans, the Middle Eastern uh, cultures, and the Eastern Asian cultures all share the same kind of formation of the way necklaces and jewelry were made. They have found wire um, jewelry like this, like show right here. They have found it in Babylonia. And uh, in the grave, the tombs of the Ur dynasties. So this this technique has been done for centuries. Everybody relearns it as they get they notice that somebody else is doing it. So this is period. Uh, you can you will have it in France. You will have it in Egypt. You will have it in. Uh, Britain, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, you will have it in Iceland. They have found um, tombs, burial sites that have a lot of this material among the, the uh, people that were buried there. So anything that you make like that with this kind of material, it's period. It's made with a more technically evolved way now, the present day, but the, the form of the beads and materials of the beads, glass is glass is glass. Uh, it's period. Bone is period. Wood is period. Using semi-precious stone. And a lot of cultures, they were using uh, chips for their necklaces, especially the uh, 
poor uh, parts of society, they, if they had got access to the materials, they would just break it into chips and a strain on a necklace. And then you'd have the more sophisticated, faceted uh, stones. Just whatever they traded for or material they made. And in a lot of cultures, clay is known throughout the world. That's why you see most a lot of this on the Viking necklaces in the SDA now, because it clay is period. Everybody was playing with it, and everybody was using it. So any of this, if you make a necklace, it is period. And no one and if they make a differ, all they have to do is look at the, the materials these are made. This is not plastic, that's an agate. That's crackle, agate. And it's, this is just one of the forms that they make these beads in. They can make them square, they can make them round, they can make them <coughs> oval, they can make a long tube and, uh, materials. Um, and glass, you can make it in tubes like this. The form, the form of the bead is still period. In the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance period and before the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. So if you want to make a necklaces to wear to events, to wear around populace or whatever, it's period. Because it, it's used with materials that, that would have been used back then and the forms that have been made. Uh, like the pictures of the, the Viking beads I showed you, not all the beads were, were per perfectly symmetrical. A lot of them were rough hewn stone or it was clay in whatever form they could play. So, and what else? Uh, anything else? Any other questions? I'm not sure what to ask. Um, majority of this stuff, of the materials I have here, I have bought, like I said, at Michael's, Joann's, and, and Hobby Lobby. I buy a lot of this stuff on sale. Yeah, like Caitlin Delise, there's a Viking necklace. Yes, that's what I made. And all those materials you can get readily available at those three stores that I named. I don't work for them, but I use their products all the time. It's, it's a great place to find materials you need for your jewelry. I've made, um, you know, just modern necklaces, um, and I've gotten my materials from um, Michael, some from Hobby Lobby, and then um, um, gem and mineral shows. I've gotten inexpensive gold beads and inexpensive um, um, freshwater pearls and inexpensive um, semi-precious um, things like, um, uh, what do you call it, um, amethyst, yes. or jade, jasper. I found jasper was really inexpensive, so I picked up a lot of jasper. Oh, yeah. And, um, but I mean, I was just just making necklaces, you know, and bracelets for myself. But I did make one when um, um, I was in SEA a very long time ago, and um, it's just been I've had a hiatus for a long time. And um, when um, when Olstead was king, uh, yeah. when he when he first rose to power, um, I I 
forgot the queen's name. Anyway, I made her a um, a bracelet, a um, a pearl and gold bead nace bracelet, and they were real pearls and real gold beads. And I I used thread, and um, she said she really liked it, but I'm not too sure that it it was quite big enough for her wrist. But you know, it was yeah, it made in such a way that you know you could just wear it like on a dress, you know, as like a yeah. circlet or you know just like string it across you know like that and um or there's a hair decoration if you wanted but um but i didn't really know um like if my gold beads if they were like period style or not i was just you know making stuff for mostly myself you know and some uh, maybe some friends and family but i wouldn't try to um copy any um medieval renaissance styles but um Anyway, um, are there are there particular styles that um, that are like indicative of say the Renaissance or necklaces that well, we don't have now? This guy right here is more. Whoops, there it is. That's more a Renaissance uh, form because it's a little more ornate and frilly. A lot of the pendants in the uh, Middle Ages tended to be, a lot of them tended to be the more uh, simpler styles, like that, donuts. You won't see them all the uh, uh, thing. Um, The, the picture with the carnelian, right there, it has a pendant on the end. Those are pearls on the end of the, the pendant. That is more or less a Renaissance variation. The one on the left is more of, I would say, early to mid, uh, mid uh, middle ages. It just depends on uh, who's making what. But you'll find a lot of paintings where you can see the difference. With the Renaissance, there's a lot more ornate uh, components with uh, connect, connecting jewel, jewels, like collars. And then others will have just the one, oops, sorry, just the one thing and they'll hang it from that. And then in places they can do the uh, hang jewels from the bottom three loops. So it just really depends on who's making the jewelry. But um, This is a pattern book. That looks medieval, doesn't it? That's a pattern. That is a, a pattern, but they they based it off mid, a middle a medieval um, format. So you can do things like that, and, it, and these are great. These are a set of pattern books that uh, were made done by Blue Moon Beach. And you get a variety of different necklaces out of this. There we go. Thank you. Plus, where are they? If you go to Hobby Lobby, they have flyers, they have in the Department of the Jewelry Department. Uh, making department that will show you pretty much everything you need to know about doing jewelry. This one is actually shows the different findings, jump rings, toggle class, tools, show you how to connect the jump rings to the wires, 
how to make pendants, simple pendants. It will also show you how to med, make a bead with its own loop. And it will show you how to crimp the bead with the crimper. Yeah. This is a crimper. And uh, the notches it has, let's see, I don't know how far I can get it there. The notches you see there, the, the back notch is the one that you squash the crimp bead first, carefully. If you squash it too much, it breaks the, the metal because it's a real thin metal. Once you get one loop like here, then the front niche notch, you squeeze it till it folds onto itself and then that wire will not move. The loop will be permanent and you can hook your toggle class or your lobster claw. And it'll, right here, shows what you can do with the extra wire, the loop, the loop. The, the metal loop, the loop of the wire, the crimp bead, and then the thing. So these are really good. One of the other instructional ones, this one right here, um, shows you different ways of doing your, your necklaces. That's, that's period format, format, this is period. These are linked beads. Each bead is, has an eye wire and an eye loop wire, and then they make another loop on there, and then they hook it to each of these together with jump rings. There's your multi strand and your different variations. And the nice thing about it, it shows all the different lengths of. The necklaces from choker, which is a smaller one, to the opera length, which is longer. And if you see a lot of the queens, Anstior queens, they have a lot of the opera type, matinee and opera uh, length necklaces, especially the amber, amber necklaces. So these are really good, both of these. And then this one, Kind of gives you an idea, gives you inspiration for doing different necklaces. What you want to put it on and what pendants, whatever. And then it shows you the three stranded necklace and bracelets and the long necklaces. And these you can find in Hobby Lobby. You can find uh, information at uh, Michael's and Joanne. Uh, Joanne's, Joanne's a lot of, they have a lot of class in a box where they have all the materials in the box. The beads, the wire, the tools, the spacers, all of that is in one box. They'll give you a set of pliers, give you the wire, everything, the findings uh, for the, the, ear, the ear wires for the earrings. And then you can do your whole, and even a handy dandy ruler. But this is a great way to learn how to do jewelry because it's all in one uh, with everything included. So you can make any kind of necklaces and this usually has a pro, um, 10 to 12 projects. And it shows you gives you instructions on how to make the loops and what now do and not do. It shows you the crimp tubes, what it looks like. So you don't, you won't have a chance of missing, messing up. And it's in this thing, a nice diagram of where everything goes how long to make the strand, make the sections of the necklace. So, 
it, it makes it a lot easier. You're not flying blind when you go to these craft stores because they'll help you any way possible. And there's a ton of photographs on paintings, photographs on the internet. And in Pinterest is another good example. It, they'll show a lot of paintings and shows you what the necklaces look like. And then there you can replicate the necklace. And it's all I have. I probably went over. Yep, I did. No, I didn't. I wished off time. I'm sorry. This is a two hour class. Um, but what are your thoughts? With what do you like playing with, with, with uh, necklaces? And because there's a wide variety, it just depends on what culture you want to play with and what do you want to play with. I've been talking. Um, well, I'm, um, I'm thinking of having a Byzantine persona. And um, so I'm not too sure exactly about the jewelry, but I mean, I know that they wore um, pretty elaborate rings. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I mean, the necklaces, um, I don't, don't really know too much about the necklaces um, or the bracelets, but I know at least like, um, you know, royalty wore incredibly elaborate clothes with real gems in them, and they wore, um, you know, very elaborate rings. Um, so, I mean, it's going to take me a while to be able to make anything like that. I'll have to, <laughs> I'll have to have something a little less elaborate, you know. Truly, I've been doing research on Byzantine jewelry, mm -hmm. and uh, to work up a ANS entry. I have found out they're not all elaborate. Hang on a second, I'll bring it to show you. Okay. Okay. These I took off from uh, downloaded pictures from the uh, British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum. Okay. Okay, let's see. Here we go. That's late Roman Byzantine. It's late oh, Roman wow. Byz is Byzantine. That is linked jewelry. And what you would see right here, that's what we, we would call now as wire wrapped links. Each of those are made separately, and each of the, the stones are, are wired separately. So then they're linked together, and that's a hook and eye clasp. But all of that is wire wrapped links in between straight links. Um, and like that. That's at the British Museum. And I ran across that by accident. Because I've been trying for a couple of years to make a jewelry project that I could do in arts and science that would be pre period. 
And here is a close up of what it looks like. These in this thing are soldered, soldered loops, but I found a wire wrap technique. I can, re I can replicate those clover leaves. And each of those stones is called Emerald Plaza. But you can use a Daventurin stone, or you can, what I'm using is it's glass. I'm using glass too. And then I can replicate it with the green glass. And that would be period. That's really cool. And I didn't know that because because I was under the assumption too that it was Byzantine at all ornate. It'd be hard. You would have to do some solder, soft soldering and cutting and all that. But no, actually considered simple necklaces uh, in the Byzantine time period as just as important as the more ornate stuff. Because I've been doing a lot of research on a lot of different sources and that's what I found. That this, this is doable for an arts and science competition. I just have to write the paper. <laughs> that's the fun part. Uh, but yeah, you can, there's a lot of different, and they did different lengths. They didn't just do the cover length. They did a figure eight length. They did, um, where they actually wire wrap to where they did the, I had done one, which I can't find it now. But what they would do is stick up a, a length of wire through the bead, then one end, they would wrap it into a loop and then make it, that would make one loop do the same thing with the other end and then or they were you could do jump rings in between the other way was before they finished this side they hooked it in they wire wrapped an eye on the next piece then wire this one would wire wrap into the other one and it would hook them together like this and they make a necklace. A lot of necklaces in period, especially in the more rural areas, would use that technique of wrapping link to link because it's the easiest and simplest way of getting it together. So yeah, doing a Byzantine necklace is not as hard as you think. You can do them, and you can do them in multi strands. Um, if you ever get a chance, I stuck in a bunch of books. Ugh, the big heavy monster. There's a copy of this in my at my. Um, college libraries is this guy. It is the glory of Byzantium. Wow. It's the arts and culture of the middle Byzantine era from 843 AD to 1261 to the fall of the Roman, the fall of the Byzantine empire. And this has jewelry, paintings, Let's 
some of the jewelry. And these are the ones with the icons, which is a Byzantine um, type of jewelry. Let's see if I'll find another one. I mean, even if you look at some of the, the scribal, that's what you will see in some of the, the charters that are being done nowadays. That's a Byzantine art manuscript. So this is a really good, I'm trying to see if I can find more jewelry. There's a lot of manuscripts in here. A lot of pendants. Armbands, bracelets, um, silverware, goblets. A lot of when they really went got Christianized, they uh, did a lot of uh, Christian symbolism in their artwork. And that was because of Constantine. Here we go. Necklaces, I mean, uh, earrings. And on this side, another earring. So they did a lot of this. It's a big honking book. Let's see if I can find the other one. I think there's a copy of that photo in the end here somewhere. I found it in several books. Um, and if you look in the uh, great period Egyptian, uh, about the same period as the Byzantine, they did a lot of simple type necklaces like this. Because I had there's a book called Ancient Faces that are show the what they did at that time period is they actually painted the person's face on the top of the casket like they would look like in real life, and they would show the jewelry we were wearing if the guys had beards and whatever, and it's really cool because you get the actual period look of how they made your jewelry and how they wore their clothes uh, and facial hair, or whatever. So you can find a lot of sources for the Byzantine and the other um, late middle, middle ages um, jewelry practices. And I have a lot of the books why I'm doing all the research <laughs> and finding a lot of stuff through interlibrary loan, which is what I do. I'm an interlibrary loan specialist, specialist for my college and I can find sources everywhere. Uh, as I say, I, I know where all the dead trees are buried, literally. <laughs> I've been doing library work since I was, I mean, I've been doing it for 40 years. Any other things? Your ideas? What you think, yes or no? We like have time. Ah, I thought it would take two, two hours if we all were working on our necklaces together, because it takes longer actually putting the necklaces together, um, especially crimping. First time you crimp, it drives you crazy. But um, that's what I have. Uh, and if you have any questions afterwards, do you have my contact information? And the bibliographies, there are a lot of um, articles and books 
that I found, especially the Viking uh, necklaces. So this is a good way to start doing your own project and stuff. And hopefully I'll get mine done by Laurel's prize turn in. Show off my necklace. <laughs> But that's it. Thank you for all for coming. I'm glad you're here. When we can see each other in person, I will do in-person classes, which are a lot more fun because then we can make things together, which is why how I normally teach my jewelry classes. But thank you all for coming. You're welcome. Uh, it was really interesting. There's a, a lot to learn. And oh, yeah. um, thank you for showing me the pictures of the Byzantine necklaces. That's, that's yeah. very helpful. And now the only reason is because I had, was searching for necklaces to see how simple you can make them and all that. And I found this guy in the British Museum. And then I have been finding this photo and a couple of the other photos in a lot of books done by the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum in books and catalogs from the both museums where and the Christie's um, auction house. He sells has sold a lot of these type of necklaces. So it's possible. And now I have a project. But I thank you all. Um, fill up that. I think I'm done. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. And y'all have a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Same you to too. You. Thank you. Bye. Sorry about the beginning of the thing. Uh, it's okay. Things happen. Technology. Yep. Y'all have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye.